Good afternoon. I call this meeting of the Human Services Policy Committee to order. Members, please take your seats. I know we're going to have a few more people in here than normal, so we'll give it a second to quiet down. Uh, the first item of business we have today is the approval of minutes from February 8th, 2023. And I am going to be uh, checking with uh, Representative Edelson. Have you re reviewed the minutes? Um, yes, um, I, and I would like to move those minutes. I don't know where I just put them. Okay, that's, uh, Representative Edelson moves the minutes from February 8th, 2023. Any questions or amendments? Hearing none, all in favor of the, of the minutes for February 8th, 2023, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. The minutes from February 8th, 2023 are approved. We have only one bill on our agenda today, and we're going to be voting it out by 2.30. Uh, we'll be hearing House File 100 from Rep Representative Stevenson. Because Representative Stevenson is not part of a committee, I will move House File 100 be re-referred to the Education Finance Committee. And Representative Stevenson, uh, would you like to explain your bill, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, House File 100 is the bill to legalize adult use cannabis in the state of Minnesota. I'm going to keep my remarks brief because I know there's always a lot of interest in this bill and potentially a lot of testimony and discussion. Uh, but uh, it's time. Minnesotans are ready. Uh, our current laws related to cannabis are doing more harm than good. There is a more sensible approach to this issue that relies not on the criminal justice system to solve problems related to cannabis, uh, but to other tools in, within our disposable. Minnesotans deserve the freedom and respect to make their own decisions about uh, cannabis, and uh, this bill is about providing them with that opportunity. Uh, the bill is comprehensive. It's 250 punch places long, and if I were to describe it in detail, we would be here uh, for the entire hour and a half just with me describing the bill, so I won't do that. Uh, but I am available for questions, uh, and I'm happy to listen to testimony as well, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. And I'd like to let folks know that as we're dealing with this bill today, that our purview is only over a number of limited sections. There's uh, in Article 1, we have Section 4. Uh, we have Section, uh, oops, I've got to make sure i got the right sheet in front of me here. Uh, uh, section uh, 64, uh, Section 66 and 69 in Article 1. In Section, in Article 4, we have Section 30. In Article 5, we have Section 4 and Paragraphs uh, G and under Subdivision 3, Paragraph E. And then Article 6 is Section 6, Section 26, Section 27, 29 through 32, 38 to 39, and then Section 39, and then Article 9, Subdivision 9. Uh, a lot of these uh, sections are dealing with setting up the SUD treatment and prevention grants and the advisory council. We will have, uh, uh, we'll be taking testifiers first. We will have an amendment and discussion after we've heard from our testifiers. We do have a number of testifiers. At this point, I'm not going to be putting a time limit on, but I'm hoping that we can move quickly enough so that by 2 o'clock we could get to the amendment and to uh, discussion and questions from members. So with that, I'll move on to the first testifier I have is uh, Joan Barron uh, from Ramsey. If you'd like to come up to the uh, desk, please. And the next person that we'll have up, to, uh, up after Joan will be Kat Franklin. So... Uh, Welcome to the committee. Thank Hi. you for being here today. Please introduce yourself and start your testimony. Thank you. My name is Joan Barron. Um, I'm here in support of HF 100. Um, let me get to my, okay. Um, thank you. My name is Joan Barron. I am in here today in support of HF 100. I have currently been enrolled in our state's medical cannabis program since roughly 2015. I damaged and entrapped a main motor and sensory nerve of my pelvis in 2001. I was 39 years old. Uh, the pain from this condition is unspeakable and it's in the most private parts of one's body. I was prescribed numerous opiates and narcotics in 2001 and my fall could not have happened at a worse time. Our teenage son had been struggling with social anxiety and depression and began self-medicating with my medications that were in my home, in my cupboard, while I was traveling to Mayo, France, and San Francisco for specialized PT. He then went on to use heroin. He died at the age of 29 from the same drug that got him addicted, my methadone. As soon as those drugs entered our house, we did not have a chance. 
I'm incredibly lucky to be here. I can't believe I made it through those years. I literally have chunks of time missing, years I don't remember. Adam wasn't as lucky. Adam was struggling and I was MIA. From physical pain, loss of job, and searching for answers to why I was still in pain. My husband was doing the best he could by keeping his mind on work. He was now the sole provider. You have no idea how stressful it is worrying every single day, every single minute, for 15 years. It takes a terrible toll on families. It's exhausting, it's heartbreaking, and it affects everyone and everything. Rule 25 was a nightmare. He couldn't go to school, he couldn't hold down a job, he couldn't be counted on or trusted. The only thing on his mind was getting his next fix. He was no longer in control of his life, heroin was. He stole from us and he stole from others. He became a felon at the age of 18 and we gave him two more on the advice from law enforcement. I regret that every single day. He was supposed to hit rock bottom, they told us. That didn't work. We sent him to Florida to, and to have him be sex trafficked for three months. We had no idea where he was. He never made it to the treatment center. The people there never picked him up at the airport. He had violent seizures. He had calluses and scars on his arms from injecting heroin and methadone. I found him numerous times hunched over completely out of it. I still can't get those images out of my head. He overdosed over and over again, treatment center after treatment center, jail time for probation violations he never could have possibly fulfilled. Um, his life was not his own. Heroin was, ruin, was running his life. And the system, that men, the system that Minnesota had for treating addicts failed us at every turn. He hated himself. He tried so hard to get clean. I know what it feels like to be physically dependent on a drug. These drugs literally rewire a person's brain. The way I perceive pain is different from someone who hasn't been taking opiate, opiates for almost 20 years. Taking them affected my relationship with my family and friends. I wasn't the same person I am now. I am a better, since using cannabis, I am a better person, a better wife, a better mom to my daughter, a better grandma, a better daughter and sister, and a better friend. I'm able to cope living with nonstop 24-7 pelvic pain because of cannabis. Our son's life was destroyed from opiates and heroin. It took everything from him, everything. Cannabis is not heroin. I cannot stress that enough. I don't care what the federal government says or how it's scheduled. It's not the same. I take great offense to anyone who claims it does. Should some people not use cannabis? Yeah, probably a lot, a lot of people. But in the same way, some folks can't drink tequila or whiskey. That doesn't mean we should pull all booze from the shelves. Regardless of the legality of it in Minnesota, people are using cannabis every single day in this state. The sky is not falling, nor will it if it becomes legal. Cannabis could have been used by myself or my son if it would have been available legally. I wish, that I, had, I, wish I hadn't insisted on abstinence-only programs. I wish I would have known more about harm reduction. I can't change our story, but others right now today should have a right, a legal right to choose a safer alternative. My son did not go from cannabis to heroin. His gateway drug was mental illness, depression, and anxiety, and he was self-medicating. Try getting someone in active addiction a mental health diagnosis. It's impossible. That way of thinking is killing people. Our medical program has been a disaster in Minnesota. Minnesota veterans, many of them are still locked out despite the discounts. Our aging population deserves to be able to choose a safer alternative, a cost-effective, safer alternative. All chronic pain patients should be able to choose a safer alternative. All Minnesotans deserve to be able to choose a safer alternative, and most certainly those battling opiate and heroin addiction. Especially when, especially when cannabis, hold on, especially when faith-based 12-step programs fail. 
and they do the majority of the time, and that is not talked about near enough. I fully support adult use cannabis legalization in Minnesota, and I thank you for listening to my testimony today. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Barron, for coming and sharing, and, and sorry I for the last year's. I have pictures of myself on opiates and my son before and after. If you would like to see them, I'm okay. Thank you. Cool. Next, I have uh, Kat Franklin, and then after Kat Franklin will be Ro Roxanne Anderson. If you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Katherine Franklin, and I'm an alcoholic. But I'm also an a cannabis advocate and a cannabis operations consultant. And as well, I'm a recovery coach in the state of Minnesota and other states. I'm not here to say that I'm a doctor. I'm not going to give you statistics that we can debunk or we can approve. But I'm here to explain what I know as a recovery coach for 15 years, as well as somebody in recovery for 21 years. Lobbyists and lawmakers within the U.S. and government have long been committed to the, having the belief that marijuana is a gateway drug. But with scientific analysis and studies, programs like DARE, as well as the Attorney General Loretta Lynch, have revoked that. Though the nation is a medical marijuana does lead to using harder drugs. It does not. They're trying to prove that. What that is, it's saying, is there is a gateway drug to consider. There's alcohol tobacco, prescription drugs. Gateway drug is not a medical term. Gateway drug is something that we open up our own door. That is us. It's another world of addiction. When I was told at five and six and in the age of 18 that my alcohol was gonna get me into harder drugs, it never did. When I was told if I did cannabis, I was gonna end up using heroin and I never did. Gateway is just an opening speak. It's a program that lets us learn to le go on our own path. Some people can walk on a path and have one drink. Some people can walk on a path and never look back. It's about our genetic code. Our genetic code is not up to us, but it's already been determined in us. We're not gonna genetically test everybody every single day to see if they should be drinking or doing cannabis. It's my body, my choice. As a perfect example, my best friend, she's absolutely amazing. She can have one drink with a little Yeti of water. When I'm over there looking at her saying, you'll never be a really good alcoholic. At the end of the day, I was that person that could have only 20 drinks. We try to shelter that gateway. But what I want to say is, if we try to control what these gateways are, then we need to control more things. We need to ban sex. We need to ban shopping. We need to ban fantasy football, and as well as pets, because none of us can just have one. <laughs> Marijuana is not a gateway drug. It's actually a gateway to some recovery. I'm not sure how many of you guys have had physical withdrawals. I have. It is a mental and physical. I shook. I had seizures. I was nauseated. I, was in, I had insomnia. But if I do look at some of the medical terms that cannabis helps, it has helped seizures, nauseation, insomnia, and so much more. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just going to put the two together. I'm not only just an alcoholic, but I'm also the godmother of one of the most seeked after strains of the 20th century a plant that I believe in, a plant that has helped so many, a plant that has been nominated by the Wounded Warriors vets. I can't tell you how many veterans I've met along my cannabis journey that was able to take the 16 to 20 drugs that was given to them by the VA and set them aside and be transparent and present for their family because of cannabis use. But at the gateway, I feel we can always run away from whatever we're hiding from. But that's not the choice of cannabis or any other drug. That's the choice of us. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, we have Roxanne Anderson. And then after Roxanne Anderson is Glenn McElfresh. Hello, welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roxanne Anderson, um, and uh, I am in favor of uh, HF100. I'm here today to um, 
show support for this uh, important piece of legislation. I've been working in the harm reduction field for about 20 years, and I've worked in treatment centers and community groups. I've done street-based outreach uh, and worked in drop-in centers. Uh, there's plenty of evidence-based research showing that cannabis is a safer option. Studies show that cannabis is an effective, safer harm reduction approach to opiates and other, dr and other drugs. I'm a board member of Southside Harm Reduction, and we provide harm reduction access and services for people who use drugs. We know that uh, there are safer options out there, and cannabis has been proved to help reduce pain. Um, and we uh, know that this is one of the leading reasons why people begin using opiates in the first place. We know that we can reduce overdoses if people have safer options. Um, and we really believe in a compassionate care option um, to go along with this legislation. Thank you again today for listening, and I appreciate your work. Thank you for your time. Uh, next we have Glenn McElfresh, and then after that will be Thomas Evanstead. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead, welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself and start your testimony. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chair Fisher, committee members, and Representative Stevenson, thank you for allowing me to speak today on HF100. My name is Glenn McElfresh, and I'm a co-founder of Plift, a hemp-derived beverage company. A few years ago, my dad's best friend, Jim, was diagnosed with terminal bone cancer. Over the period of a few short months, he transformed from a vibrant man capable of hucking 80-pound chunks of granite to a bedridden skeleton racked with unbearable pain 24 hours a day. Jim asked me to buy him gummies because the THC helped him manage his pain and delay heavy narcotics. Jim's cancer was so aggressive that he wouldn't have been able to get a medical card before he died. And even if he did, he couldn't afford the gummies because Illinois' medical cannabis program was far too expensive for his budget. I spent $500 on gummies and Rick Simpson oil to help Jim delay hospice for no more than a few weeks. The last time I saw Jim, he thanked me for the gummies. <laughs> if the current version of HF100 passes, it would make life harder for Minnesotans like Jim, who need cannabinoids to manage symptoms of chronic and acute ailments, but can't afford the outrageously high prices charged by Minnesota's two medical cannabis manufacturers. Hemp-derived cannabinoids are a godsend for lower- and middle-income Minnesotans. If the current version of HF100 passes, it will kill the hemp-derived cannabinoid market until the adult use market is established. The relevant language is subtle and could easily be overlooked, but it's there at 23.1, 27.26, and 234.18 of the fifth, fifth engrossment. Today you can buy a 100 milligram hemp rub from Nothing But Hemp right here in Minneapolis. This lotion reduces inflammation and will not get you high. You can buy a CBD beverage at Whole Foods or a THC beverage from Certix. Under this new bill, Certix, Whole Foods, and Stephen Brown, the BIPOC veteran owner of Nothing But Hemp, must stop sell, selling some of these products by July 1st, 2023, and all of these products by the end of the year. There is nothing in HF100 that helps Mr. Brown, his business, his employees, or his customers, the Minnesotans, plan for a life without cannabinoids. No one has been able to explain to me why we need a competitive and expensive license to sell hemp products, and I've asked. In my prior testimony, I've relied on my cannabis industry and cannabis application writing expertise to identify issues the untrained eye might overlook. I would like to use this testimony to offer some solutions. If the authors of HF100 and SF73 seriously want to pass the best adult use marijuana bill in the United States, and I believe they do, the bill must regulate hemp and marijuana separately and issue an unlimited number of licenses in every license category. If the current version of HF100 passes, by the end of 2023, nearly every single hemp drive product on the shelves today will be illegal, and you better believe there will be an outcry of Minnesotans asking you, their representatives, where their relief went, when it is coming back, and why you took it away in the first place. To be perfectly clear, PLIFT is in full support of legalization, decriminalization, and repair that needs to be done in the communities most impacted by the war on drugs, but not at the expense of the established federally legal hemp industry, the businesses that have invested in building their communities and are already employing Minnesotans. The mission of the Minnesota Department of Health is to protect, preserve, and improve the health of all Minnesotans. With that in mind, preserving Minnesotans' access to hemp-derived cannabinoids is a public health priority. Mr. Chair, members, and Rep. Stevenson, thank you once again for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We'll be taking questions afterwards. Uh, next will be Thomas Evanstad, and then after that will be Heather Bacchus. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself. 
Thank you very much, <clears throat> Rep. Fisher. Uh, my name is Thomas Evanstad, E-V-E-N-S-T-A-D, and I testify today in staunch support of HF100. Um, I'd like to open my comments with um, a shout out to uh, Governor Jesse Ventura. Um, the legacy media didn't cover his powerful testimony um, at the last uh, SF73, the companion bill of Senator Lindsey Port. Um, and he, like the very heart-wrenching testimony we all heard today, uh, the governor talked about how cannabis saved his life and it eased the suffering of First Lady Terry Ventura. So I'd like to thank Governor Ventura on my behalf as a Minnesota medical cannabis patient and on behalf of uh, every other medical cannabis patient in the state. Um, Governor Ventura was right about the age 18. I would like the bill to be revised so that 21 is not our benchmark. If I'm able to go and join the military and fight for our country and die for my country, I need to be allowed to uh, consume cannabis as opposed to drinking alcohol, which is the choice that I've made over a lifetime of having used practically every drug under the sun and alcohol and found that cannabis is the one uh, substance for me that is um, therapeutic, healthy, and um, beneficial to me. Everything else that I've ever tried, including alcohol, has been harmful and not beneficial. Um, and then Neil Franklin is somebody that I met that everybody will be meeting in terms of the people on the committees. Um, Neil Franklin is a commander with the Baltimore, Maryland uh, Narcotics Unit back in the day, probably the 1980s. And uh, what's relevant here is that his partner was shot dead um, in a gang drug deal, shot dead with a bullet in his head over just cannabis. There wasn't heroin, fentanyl, and you know, thousands of pills. It was a cannabis deal. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, and there's been at least one person that I know of that was shot dead over a backpack, $200 worth of cannabis. People are dying in this state over cannabis. Um, and then the most important thing that I want to mention is that previously I had testified regarding the history of cannabis. Henry Anslinger, uh, 1937, the United States government um, prohibited cannabis largely because of the industrial cotton and uh, fiber barons knew that once hemp was now getting into the, you know, the cotton mill gins, the um, industrial, they were able to scale it so that then they began this racist attack about cannabis. And it actually lands right here at the University of Minnesota, where in the United States congressional record, it talks about, quote, big lipped Negroes that, not verbatim, but that were getting white women pregnant at our University of Minnesota, and it was blamed on cannabis. It's part of our con congressional record. It's shameful, but it's real. So my testimony goes to the heart of the purview of this committee. Should you move it along, or should you stop this thing in its tracks? And toward that end, um, I would like to close with people that are a lot wiser than I will ever hope to be, I think. And what I'm saying is prior to the Civil War, cannabis was a very successful drug when used to cure insomnia and impotence. It was used primarily to reduce tension. Now, couldn't we use that in our society right now? Tension reduction, we really could. Early letters from our founding fathers often refer to the pleasures of hemp smoking, said Dr. Burke. There are even references to it in the congressional records Marijuana never became a commercial industry because the plant was too easy to grow. George Washington, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson all cultivated weed on their plantations. George Washington is said to have preferred a good pipe full of the, quote, leaves of hemp, unquote, to any alcoholic drink. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington or often corresponded about the virtues of smoking hemp and are said to have traded parcels of it as gestures of friendship. James Madison once remarked that had it not been for hemp, he would not have had the insights he had in the work of creating a new and democratic nation. So, members of the committee, Rep. Fisher, I appreciate your time today. And I urge you to think about where we were at with cannabis in terms of the idea, the very idea of this nation was freedom. George Washington in 1840 famously made a quote about prohibition, essentially that you can't legislate people what they're gonna consume and you can't make laws illegal for things that are not crimes. So thank you once again, and uh, God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Heather Bacchus, and after that will be Randy Bacchus. Please uh, take a seat at the table. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Uh, please go ahead and identify yourself and begin your testimony. Hello. 
Mr. Chair Fisher and members of the Human Services Policy Committee, thank you for allowing us to submit written testimony in opposition to the cannabis bill HF100. I'm Heather Backus and this is my husband Randy. We're actually going to testify together. Um, uh, we're the parents of a forever 21-year-old son who died because of cannabis-induced psychosis and completed suicide on July 17th, 2021. We're here on behalf of Minnesotans that deserve better and for those families of loved ones struggling with addiction and mental health that are fearful to come forward. Our son is dead, so it's too late for us, but we want to prevent others from experiencing tragedy. Our son Randy started using cannabis at the age of 15. It was readily available. At 16, he was diagnosed with a severe cannabis use disorder and was sent to wilderness therapy. At 18, he moved to Colorado, a legal use state. He believed cannabis was beneficial like many people in this room. At 19, he had his medical marijuana card and took cannabis in its various forms, flour, vapes, dabs, edibles. With use, he suffered anxiety and depression and eventually became grandiose, paranoid, and delusional. In March of 2021, he went into full-blown psychosis, believing the mob was after him, that his phone and computer were being bugged. Imagine getting that phone call at 11 o'clock at night with your kid completely freaking out. Think about it. Cannabis caused all of that. In April of 2021, he reported to the police that he was suicidal and he was admitted for a three-day hold in the psychiatric hospital. Although he marked every box that he was suicidal on his intake, after 24 hours, he was released because there were no beds available. Three months later, he completed suicide. Cannabis caused that. Today's cannabis, much different than what's been mentioned in this room. So in all, Excuse, in all fair, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, Thank Randy you. Backus. Uh, Randy Backus. Um, so just to be clear, we don't have any financial interest in this. So I'm going to give you a quick lesson in cannabis, marijuana, and THC. Because I found that most people have no idea what this is. Okay? THC is a cannabinoid that gets users high. In the 60s through the 90s, the marijuana flower was 2% to 5% as far as THC. So as it's evolved, it's commercialized, it's become on average 23 to 25% THC. That's for the flower. THC is, is extracted from a cannabis flower. So as they go to make these concentrates, I'm, I'm sorry, so let me backtrack here. So basically the concentrates, if you put them into, into different forms, they're made from the plant, but they're not, the plant is no longer God made. This is stuff that has been engineered in hybrids, this is not your weed you grew up with. They create um, concentrates with gummies, uh, chocolates, drops, anything that can be vaped, eaten, or drank. The potency on some of those items can, it, can reach 95% and greater, THC. So to kind of bring up to speed, I was going to ask who knows what dabs are. I'm going to guess most of you probably don't know what dabs are. A few do, probably the younger people, okay? Bottom line is a dab is a high concentrate of marijuana, THC, okay? This is, this is not, this is available in the states that have legalized it. When you take that, it's called, could be called wax, shatter, honey, goes by a lot of different names, different products, different, different highs. Simple fact is one dab, which is highly um, potent, is equivalent to four to five joints. It's, sci it's scientifically proven that high potency THC changes the brain. And in cases with younger people, it goes in, it disrupts their brain, it disrupts their development. So keep in mind that when we're looking at these younger people from age, from up until the age of 25 for young women and 28 for young men, their brains are still developing. If we look at this from a scenario in 2020, an estimated 14.2 million people suffered from cannabis use disorder. In other words, that they were not able just to give up the cannabis. It was a very big part of their lives. In 2021, estimated 30.7% of 12th graders reported using cannabis during the year. 6.3% of those used it daily. Three out of 10 cannabis users eventually developed cannabis use disorder. 
Parents who use marijuana uh, increase the likelihood that their child will use marijuana, tobacco, and alcohol, as well as other drugs. Keep in mind, we're involved in different groups now trying to heal our loss. One of those groups, it started, there were 150 parents that their child was in cannabis-induced psychosis, and that was in October of 2021. That group has now grown to well over 450 parents who have kids in active psychosis due to cannabis. Think about it. HF100 doesn't cap potencies. It has a legal age use of 21. Legalization will make it easily accessible, and many will suffer the terrible effects. And let me tell you, you don't want to lose a child. None of you do. In a legal use state, our son reported he was suicidal. He needed help desperately. With a shortage of beds, he was released only to take his life three months later. Never given a social worker or a plan for treatment or advised how to pay for medical bills, he did not get the human services that he desperately needed. Our youth are already struggling. Mental health systems are overwhelmed. For eight years, the New York Times called for cannabis legalization. In June of 2022, the Times published a long article headlined, Psychosis, Addiction, Chronic Vomiting. As weed becomes more potent, teens are getting sick. Think about your loved ones. This weekend, I met with two parents who have kids that are 18, addicted to cannabis, looking for advice and help. What do we do? And they're just, they're great kids, but they're gonna lose their lives to this drug. Do you want to normalize a psychoactive drug that is addictive, causes anxiety, depression, paranoia, psychosis, and if not stopped, eventually schizophrenia? What will the cost be? Not only monetarily, but socially and emotionally. Please think with your heart, and please use your intellect and your conscience. This bill is supported by an industry that stands to profit from addiction and get young people hooked. We can do better. We can create social justice, decriminalize, and expunge records. People have access to medical marijuana. Do not commercialize and normalize this damaging substance. Today's marijuana, cannabis, and weed, it's not the same as it used to be. Research, read, learn. Don't let more kids become dead like my son. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony and uh, sorry for and condolences on the loss of your son. Next, I have uh, John Hausladen, and then after that will be Ted Gallaty. If you'd like to come forward, please introduce yourself. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is John Hausladen, president of the Minnesota Trucking Association. As we've testified in numerous committees, we have serious concerns about the bill uh, as users of the highway and as employers and contractors with those who use commercial driver's license, we have a unique perspective on this. And we do fundamentally think that legalizing recreational marijuana will make the roads less safe, and we do think it will impact our workforce. Uh, we do want to thank uh, uh, the chief author, Representative Stevenson, for meeting with us and having conversations about some of the things that we can work on as we look forward to working on that. I, I want to talk to you today about two concerns, I think, that are the purview of this committee, though, to think about and to build on some of the previous testimony. And that is, of course, funding for rehabilitation services and tracking impacts on workforce. So we understand that if this is legalized, there is the potential that any employee could be tested because they are demonstrating that their behavior at work is uh, not meeting the standard to do their job safely. So let's say that an employee then is tested and an employee is tested positive. What is the path for that employee going forward in terms of their employability, particularly in businesses that are regulated by uh, Department of Transportation regulations federally? Air, rail, maritime, school bus drivers, metro transit drivers, truck drivers. So we have experience with this. In the trucking industry, if you are tested positive, either pre-employment, random, post-accident, reasonable suspicion, you're given the opportunity to enter into a rehabilitation program. And under that program, uh, your employer or contractor gives you a reference to resources, substance abuse professionals, and then you can begin down that path. 
So we now have people entering a system where they will have to interact with a medical doctor, most likely a psychologist, a substance abuse uh, addiction e expert, and there is not funding individually for a person to then fund this. It's not the employer's responsibility. They don't bear it now, they won't bear it then. So one of our big concerns is, as you move forward with this bill, if it goes forward, is what is going to be the direct upfront money for any person, any employee, any contractor who in the workplace has now been identified and wants to get better, wants to go through a rehabilitation service and wants help. What is the funding they're gonna have because they may not have the money personally? What is the funding the system and the provider is gonna to have to provide it? Because that links to the second point. We need our workers today, everyone. The young men and women, the old men and women and everyone in between in Minnesota need to be productive. And so we wanna make sure that the workforce is not reduced, not hampered. And one of the other things we request then in the bill is that there is more detailed tracking about workforce impacts, about employee participation, about user uh, use of the service under human services, uh, under productivity, uh, all of these different measures so that as we go down the road, if this is legalized, we can really understand those impacts and make sure we have the right tools and resources in place to address that. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee today. You're welcome, thank you for being here. Next I have uh, Ted Gallaty, after that will be Keith Gronov. Uh, welcome to the committee, sir. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Please start. Thank you, committee talk. chair. Thank you, committee. My name Ed is Ted Galati and I am the owner operator of Willow's Keep Farm in Zimbrota, Minnesota. In 2018, we went down this cannabis road. We were uh, growing corn for a corn maze and doing agritourism and a pumpkin patch. And history changed. So we started growing industrial hemp under the Minnesota Department of Ag and we grew Hemp Maze Minnesota. So that is probably the first hemp maze in the country and it was with the toll the whole sole purpose to educate and inform the public about industrial hemp and this magnificent plant cannabis that we have. We also have now cannabis disc golf course. So we have a canna cannabis disc golf course that you can play, can play disc golf through the cannabis fields. And we also have um, the Old Pine Theater where we perf have a performing arts venue where we sell our products. So we sell our products on the farm at a farm store that's open year round. And then we have our performing arts venue where we now sell our products, which do include the low potency THC products as well. Now hemp, Cannabis is the only plant that can clothe you, it can shelter you, it can feed you, and it can heal you. Think about that, no other plant can do that. In 1937, as you heard, Harry Aslinger, with the help of William Randolph Hearst, demonized this plant and started fear-mongering about this plant. Really with political purposes, because this plant could obviously compete with cotton, petroleum, lumber, paper, everything, food, fuel. So this began. And then in 1971, President Nixon signed into law the Controlled Substance Act, which listed cannabis as a controlled substance, a level one narcotic. That include all of industrial hemp as well. So why am I here? A couple reasons. First and foremost, this is a human service committee, and this is an accessibility issue that we have. First and foremost, every one of you has an endocannabinoid system in your body. Everybody in this room. Every mammal has it too, so your animals have it as well. We've had a relationship with this plant for thousands of years, and only through the prohibition for the last, you know, since 1937 have we had an issue with not having access to this plant. You have cannabinoid receptors in your brain and your spinal column, and you also have them throughout your nervous system, your immune system, and your internal organs. Why were those receptors placed there? Well, for cannabinoids. And the body does produce cannabinoids. However, the body doesn't produce enough cannabinoids and most likely when you get enough production of cannabinoids is when you're a high level athlete. I was a bodybuilder, competitive athlete for years. I'm 51, but I still ski competitively on a water ski course in my backyard. And believe it or not, I use cannabis to perform better. 
when you hear about the runner's high, that is cannabis. Those athletes have access to cannabis because they're pushing their body to the extreme. You also hear about Michael Jordan saying, hey, I'm in the zone. The zone, that's cannabis. Those are cannabinoids being pushed into the system. So a lot of our people that live in the state don't have access to this. They can't perform at those levels. So what do they do? They can ingest it. They can smoke it. They can rub it on topically and get the benefits of cannabis into their body. Now, you've been lied to. Cannabis is not a drug. It's not a narcotic. You can look this up. It's not a stimulant. It's not a depressant. So what is it? Well, believe it or not, as I just stated, since the body produces it, it more mimics a hormone. It's like vitamin D. You go in the sun, you get vitamin D. But hey, if you're not able to get it in the sun, what can you do? You can ingest it, you can get it through your food, fortified food. So in the future, I actually think that we will see fortified food with cannabinoids, believe it or not. We're just in the early stages of this. Um, but I want you to realize that, that, that we need cannabis in our diet. We need it all the time. Now, this is a nonpartisan issue, this bill. Um, more than likely, it's going to move through. I just, I have some problems with how it is currently. I know we're up to, I know Representative Stevenson said we're up in the 200 range, but I think we're almost uh, getting closer to 300. Um, in this bill, right now, hemp is listed 377 times. Marijuana is only listed 73 times. I know this is an adult use cannabis bill, but I have questions on why hemp is listed so, ma so much of the time in here. I think it would be better off if we kept it as a recreational or adult use THC bill and we had a hemp, we just left the hemp alone because that's my livelihood. And to be honest with you, I'm not about getting everybody high. That's not why I'm here. I'm here more for the health and nutritional aspect of it. So, you know, I don't want to debate that today. What I really want to do is just say, hey, watch how we list this, because right now there are some serious concerns with the hemp growers in this state that we may no longer be able to provide access to our products to the public. Um, there are also 14 licenses in the bill. Uh, again, I know there's a low potency license, but there's a delivery, there's, there's transportation, there's manufacturing, there's cultivation. It goes on and on and on. Right now I pay $650 a year by the MDA to be licensed to grow hemp and to produce and basically process my hemp. Now you're putting more restriction on me. I feel like it's also a grab where 8% tax, I know that that's what we're kind of looking at right now with this cannabis bill, but I know Walls, Governor Walls wants 15% tax. And I assume that you're going to take all the CB products, all the CBD drinks, everything, throw it under this bill and grab money from us or from, I should say, from the consumer. So I don't think that that's right either. I think the sales tax should stay the same for the hemp derived products. There's also an import endorsement that's in this bill that right now I get products from my partners and my friends in other states. Remember, this is industrial hemp. It's 100 percent legal. It's interstate commerce, commerce is 100% legal. Right now I get products from California, Colorado, Wisconsin, Arizona, and North Carolina. If this bill moves through as is, I will have to get an import endorsement every time I bring in a product out of state. We have a duopoly here. We have a medical marijuana mafia. I know you're all aware of it. It's Chicago owned by the Wrigley family and the Jim Beam family. That needs to go away. We can't continue that. That needs to go away. Sales of out of alcohol are 18. If you're, uh, if you're of 18 years of age, you can sell alcohol in a restaurant, in a bar setting. Um, and believe it or not, in this state, you don't even need to be, you can be 12 years old and sell tobacco. My question to you is, right now, in order to sell any cannabinoid products, you're gonna have to be 21. My daughter works at the farm, she's 17 right now, and she will not be able to be in the store, I guess, selling our products if this bill moves through. So that's the other issue I have with this. So again, it's all about accessibility for our customers. A couple more points real quick. Um, the bill lists artificial cannabinoids, and those are cannabinoids that are derived. They can be derived from CBD. So a lot of what happens with like, like our low potency THC right now, the Delta 9 THC is actually derived from CBD. So CBD is converted into THC. 
One of the things I would like to see in this bill is that we allow hemp growers to do that on a bigger scale and actually provide the THC to the medical. It doesn't really make sense. We were talking in the other committees about energy and the energy use and the water use. I would rather see fields of hemp being produced into THC than these people coming in and making these bulk cultivating grows indoors using all that electricity, all that heat, all that water to produce the oil, the THC oil, which we can produce from hemp. So I'd like to see that bill say, hey, let's go ahead and allow the hemp people to do this and then put the cultivators that are growing for the high potency flower indoors. Last thing I'm just gonna stop on, um, cause I know my time's running long here. Low potency THC right now. I don't know why in the bill it limits C CBD to 25 milligrams. I know a lot of you aren't aware of what CBD does, but CBD is the calming part of the plant. It calms the high. So if you load up your product with more CBD, it's gonna calm the potential for the high. So I'd like to not see a cap on, on any CBD and low potency THC products. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close with that. I am here for questions. I'm also available if you wanna reach out to me. Um, that's what we do, we educate and inform the public on cannabis. So thank you very much for your time, committee. Thank you, committee chair. You're welcome. <clears throat> thank you for your testimony. Next I have Keith Gronov. If you'd like to come forward, introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Welcome to the committee today. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Uh, my name is Keith Grunov. Can you hear me? My name is Keith Grunov, and I live in New Hope. <clears throat> I'm here today to speak in opposition of HF 100, the proposed bill legalizing marijuana for adult recreational use. There are a number of reasons for my opposition. First, uh, in my own desire, uh, excuse me, first is my own decision to use marijuana as a young adult. Growing up in the middle Midwest uh, during the 70s, I was exposed to and participated in the marijuana culture. It was a cool thing to do. <clears throat> Over time, marijuana became an increased need for me. But as a result of a life-changing experience, I was able to quit. And today, by God's grace, I've been smoke-free for many years. Many of you are aware of the dangers associated with marijuana use. Let me list just a few from my own experience. <clears throat> uh, I would say number one would be uh, uh, clouded uh, judgment, lack of motivation at times, slow reflexes uh, based on, um, for instance, if uh, driving a car and uh, trying to maintain <clears throat> everything you're supposed to when you're driving, uh, it's, it's, it's a problem. Marijuana has, uh, I believe, has an addictive nature, whether it's psychological or physical, that's up for debate. Um, and of course, the impact on the lungs is uh, used in an extended period of time uh, and with the addition of the uh, THC levels in today's marijuana, the impact of this drug is even a bigger concern. Secondly, passage of this bill would encourage even more young people to experiment. For instance, uh, if it's legal, it's okay, right? I mean, that's, that's the thought, but that's a bad assumption. It's the, it's the mindset of many young people. Our young adults have enough roadblocks to deal with in today's world without adding another. Legalizing this drug is not the answer. Today, the marijuana industry has come out in force to promote marijuana cannabis as a safe product. Left out of their conversation and their ads are the dangers associated with it. I recognize uh, possibilities associated the possible applications this drug has in controlled medical context. And we've heard about some of that. <clears throat> but this current bill goes far beyond that. Several organizations have already spoken up against uh, about this bill. <clears throat> People have testified, as we've heard also, uh, related to the health hazards. 
and I would urge this committee to take a closer look at these concerns. <clears throat> Your vote matters. This vote goes beyond party lines. <clears throat> As you think of today's young adults and the future they face, what's the legacy that you want to leave with them? When the final vote's taken and the smoke is cleared in this debate, I hope you will agree with me that a no vote is the right decision. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are, is there anyone else from the public that would like to testify on House File 100? Peter, if you'd Peter, like, Peter, I know I told you I wasn't going to so, do this. Oh, so please, 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 go ahead, go ahead, please introduce yourself yes, please. for the record. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Thank you to this committee. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Thank you to everyone on this committee. The, the one, one thing that I would like to say is I've spent well over 32 years of my life to create the second most restrictive medical program in the country, okay? And when I say that, I say that with great, great, um, great words and wisdom because when I was looking at this program about 10 years ago before the medical marijuana program came about, I was very much against the registry and some of those things because I thought it was going to impact my life from a quality of life standpoint. What I mean by that is out of the 290 pages, almost 300 pages of legislation, and I've talked to a couple people in this room earlier today, I don't see any real protections for folks that are living in subsidized housing, Section 8, public housing, or any type of group home or communal living situation. And I also, if I go one step further, a lot of times my wife and I and my daughter like to vacation uh, and on the holidays. So we go out of town on the holidays. The last couple of years, we haven't been able to do that. My wife also sits in a wheelchair and does everything with her feet. Many of you probably have seen her testify in a number of situations. So she actually encouraged me, Peter, to come and give you this testimony today. And she said to tell Peter, if he doesn't like it, tell him you're just practicing and tell him which committee would you like me to deliver a better testimony in. So. <laughs> Come on, Peter. <laughs> so, I, I would say th you're, you're, you're doing a good job testifying here, Mr. Paulson. Just keep going. Thank you. So that I did reach out to Representative Stevens' office based on your recommendation over the weekend. I have not been able to connect with you, so I hope we are able to do that. But what I have noticed, and I've been in constant contact with the Office of Medical Cannabis over the last several years, and more importantly, over the last couple of months, okay? What I was told in September, or October, rather, is that they were working with a couple Republicans in, in secret to address the hotel tour, tourism industry. Meaning, more, more importantly, when I go to vacation with my family in the holidays, right? I go to use my cannabis, which is often out of my hotel room. It's usually in a public space, down away from, from the hotel lobby or somewhere out, out of the general public. What generally happens is I will leave the hotel, a couple days later, I'll get a $250 charge. On my hotel, on my hotel bill, I'll then call them back, and I'll say, "What? What is this? Can you tell me what this is?" And they'll say, "It's a smoking char charge, because you you smoke marijuana." And I said, uh, "Yeah, that's true. I smoke marijuana, and yeah, that, it, this looks like a sm smoking charge, 
but can you tell me more about it? And more importantly, Christmas time, um, not last Christmas because I was afraid to go to the hotel this last Christmas, but the Christmas before, I went to the hotel and four days later, I got $250 charged on my hotel bill because they said a piece that broke off of my wife's wheelchair looked like a smoking device. And they, and they said the reason they were going to charge me because of this d dangerous apparatus that they claimed was a smoking device. And I said, well, and I looked around and I thought, well, gee. And then I looked at my wife's chair and I was like, oh yeah, that's that piece that my wife, that my daughter keeps jumping on that odd, oddly broke off. And we just threw in the corner of the hotel room. And they, when, when I lost my cartridge, my vape cartridge, which I use daily all the time, when I lost one of my cartridges in the hotel room, I asked the hotel staff to go look for it. Oddly enough, they did not find my medicine, but they found that piece of broken device that they claimed was a smoking device. And I asked them to show it to me, and they said they already took a picture of it and sent it to corporate. And I said, if I call corporate and they refuse to show it to me, by law, you, have, you should give that back to me. And, and they said, we call corporate, they're not gonna show it to you, we're gonna reverse the charge. So what I'm saying is, because we have flour in this program today, right? And a lot of us get the benefits of using flour and, and a number of other products, right? I am afraid to, to take my flour to the hotel. I am afraid to bring my flour to the capital complex, okay? Because I've had staff, I've had security guard complain to me when I'm rolling my medicine or preparing my medicine in the bathroom. I've had them complain and say, hurry, there's a group of kids coming in. We don't want them to see you with your marijuana on this counter. I'm like, well, that's okay. Just tell them it's medicine and, and the, we'll be fine. And, and what has happened is it's caused me and my wife not to want to go to hotels, not to want to hang out in, in greater Minnesota, not to engage with the, with the general public. So what I, what I came here today to tell you guys to do is to protect the medical program to the best of your ability and do not let it phase out in a couple of years because the medical program is, is the necessity of what's, of what's gonna drive how you look at this product, okay? Also the, the recreational side of it, it's once that goes through, and I hope you guys pass it this year, um, once that goes through, that will greatly subsidize the cost for us medical patients that Excuse use me, Mr. This. Paulson. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, we need you to wrap up. I do have a couple other people that want to testify yet and we still need to have our discussion. We do have an amendment here. So. Great, I'll, I'll wrap up right now and we'll, we'll call that practice number one. Okay. And, uh, and, I'll, <laughs> and I'll call you and you'll tell me where we go next. All right, thank you, Mr. Paulson. Uh, from what I understand, there are a couple of other people. I see uh, a woman over here, if you'd like to come to the table, please. Identify yourself and I think there's- Hi Sue, come on down, come visit me. I know Daryl from back in 1989. Right. And what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to try to keep us to about two minutes each here. Uh, I'd, I'd like to be able to get to the committee so the committee can have some time to discuss it. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and start up and. Thank you, Thank Representative you. Fisher oh. and committee members. Um, my name is Susan Sint and um, I live in Maplewood. Um, I have all sorts of stuff that I wrote that I've added to it and I'm going to try and not say stuff that's already been said because there's a lot of great testimony here. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about me so that um, my opinion has some credibility. 
Um, as I said, I live in Maplewood. I grew up in Matamida on the shores of White Bear Lake. Um, I graduated from Matamida High School. I went off to St. Cloud State University where I got a biology degree. Um, and then I actually finished my education at Hamlin and I'm not done. Um, I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in the service industry. I've worked as a nursing assistant. I've worked as a daycare provider. I've worked as a high school science teacher and I've worked as a substitute and now I am a business owner. And just to be fair, I kind of ended up in this industry by accident, but I do distribute the hemp products and I am interested, interested in distributing marijuana or somehow staying in the industry. Um, I, um, you know, I, I'm concerned because there's a lot of parts of this bill that have problems that need to be fixed. And what I see is a lot of conflation where it's really easy to make the mistake of trying to follow models of other uh, substances like alcohol or tobacco or prescription medications, but cannabis is very unique and so it needs to be regulated very uniquely. Um, and I see you kind of rushing through like it's gonna happen and I'm, I'm worried that, I mean, I, I want marijuana to be legalized. I wanna end the war on drug users it's unconstitutional, it is disrespectful. But if you pass a law and a bill that doesn't meet the needs of all the people, you're still gonna have prohibition. Um, the part of the bill that I really take, I'm really concerned about is limiting the amount of cannabis that a person can have on their property or that they can grow. Um, again, it's a very complicated product. Okay, I, I, will, I just wanna say that um, I worked as a science teacher at Harding High School for 10 years, and I'm very triggered by what happened at Harding last Friday, and I don't know what happened. None of us know what happened, but I know that prohibition is disrespectful to people and respect, just disrespect, just like respect is mutual. And if we want, we can do better. In the words of Deb Henton, my mentor, we can do better and we all do better when we all do better. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you'd like, you can also send the uh, information that you're able pre to present. If you could type it up and send it to us, then we'll get it posted and submit it to the committee. Oh, so, that's a lot. all right, th <laughs> thank you. And then I've got one more per uh, gentleman over here and then you know, two minutes and then I'm gonna move on to the committee here. Uh, so that we can deal with an amendment we have and do any testimony and then we'll be voting by 2.30. Uh, so thank you for being here, sir. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and start your testimony. Uh, yeah. My name is Brent Olson. Speaking in this pub public forum is maybe my worst nightmare, but I have a lot of experience in this industry in plant production and licensing. Applied in it with my company, Northwoods Cannabis in Michigan had a lot of issues with, you know, broken rubric systems from municipality to municipality. So I'm here to let you in support of the fact that there should be one rubric across every town, every city, blanket. We need one organization, one group of people looking at these licenses and these applicants to make sure that it is fair every step of the way. Because when you start segmenting it out, you get nepotism, you get people that don't believe in the industry and the only ones that get licenses in their towns are people that they trust. And we just can't have that. We need a good equitable system for across the state for every Minnesota resident, period. End of discussion. Another thing I have issue with is um, the plant count for growing. I find it very arbitrary. I can put a plant in the ground in May and grow it into a 14 foot tall plant that's gonna yield 10 pounds, and I can still grow three more. I think it should be a square footage issue. I should be able to cultivate cannabis how I choose. I don't wanna grow a big plant to get the yields that I want. I wanna grow maybe many small plants. Maybe I wanna deal with genetics. How am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to do any sort of breeding program for myself and be able to hold my genetics that I've created that work for me, that work for maybe my disabilities my anxiety, I created this strain and I want to cross it onto something else. This is impossible to do with the plant count limits and that's just not fair. Minnesota residents should be able to experiment and have these abilities. 
So it should just be a square footage issue, just like it is for all the other cultivators. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. If you could just wrap up here. Well, I wish I had more time. There's a lot to talk about on this issue, especially when it comes to public public safety. Um, and, and it's coming to some of the other committees yet, so you'll have an opportunity yeah, I'll, I'll to present at some of those. Um, one last thing I would just say is look at um, the licensing structure for micro businesses, and these businesses should be allowed to operate in separate locations from retail to production. It's going to be very hard for small businesses to find a location that can house everything that you want to do, as well as have a retail location that's going to be in an area that's applicable for anyone to be able to go to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, with that, uh, public testimony is closed. We will move on. If there are others, I'd like to mention that we did have a number of uh, documents that were submitted in testimony letters, so I hope that the committee will look at it. For those who have not been able to testify today or are interested, please go ahead and submit to us a written letter, and we'll make sure that gets uh, posted online and part of our packet going forward. With that, we will move on to the uh, amendment, we have the A50 amendment. I was wondering who would be interested in offering the A50 amendment. Representative Baker. Representative Baker, would you like to move your A50 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I would like to do that. Um, should uh, I Representative Baker moves the A50 amendment. Representative Baker, please uh, explain your amendment. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to uh, Representative Stevenson. We've had a chance to visit about this a little bit. Um, a lot of you know that I am pretty active in the uh, recovery treatment um, uh, world of substance use disorder and this uh, amendment I think really helps clarify a little bit about the part of the recovery side of treatment that sometimes gets overlooked a little bit. So the uh, grant program that's listed on page 116 and um, line something here according to the uh, amendment, just I want to make sure that we include the word recovery in, into the amendment. It's very simple. Uh, I just want to recognize that as being a part of our process of helping people. I like um, this part of the bill where they're recognizing that we have to provide some grant money for folks like this. Um, and so again, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I, have, uh, I look forward to hearing uh, the, the uh, author's uh, thoughts on this, and I hope that we can support something like this. Uh, thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Baker. Uh, I encourage members to vote yes on this amendment. I think it's a great addition uh, to the bill. I appreciate you uh, noticing this and offering a constructive solution to it. Uh, so I'd ask members to vote yes. Thank you. Any other debate? Hearing none, all in favor of the A50 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. The A50 amendment is uh, uh, approved. Uh, any further discussion on the bill? Uh, Representative Backer. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm Representative, um, my question is, is, is there any enforcement mechanism or penalty for a file, um, family um, child care provider if they do not disclose adult use in a whole, you know, in a home of hours, you know, if they use the cannabis. And then I have a follow-up question. So just wondering what type of enforcement there is, because the bill talks about that there should be, but as you're well aware of, um, when people don't do something that they're not supposed to do, they're not always forthcoming with that information. So if you could address that, please, Mr. Chair. And, Representative, and Representative Stevenson. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Backer, you're correct that the bill does require disclosure uh, of the presence of this if it's outside. Of course, you can't be using it while you're looking after the kids and everything else, but it does require this disclosure you're talking about. That's consistent with what we do with other substances. In terms of enforcement, I might ask if uh, Mr. Johnson from House Research could uh, shed some light on that um, piece of it. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's Ben Johnson from House Research. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I believe that that requirement is tied to the licensing provision. There's not a specific penalty uh, described in the bill, though. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, uh, Representative Baker. Uh, Backer. Baker is next. I, I was hoping I was not going to be called Baker. I was going to compliment you on um, Chair Fisher of getting us right. So anyways, um, on the serious note here, just kidding you, Chair. Um, so um, it was mentioned that it was going to be um, happening during the licensure part, but will DHS ask 
certain questions, and maybe this is someone from DHS, during the inspection to make sure that this isn't ongoing, because what one person does today may not be what a person does a year from now. Uh, Representative Stevenson. Mr. Chair, Representative Backer, we can certainly talk to the DHS and follow up with you about that. My sense when Mr. Johnson says it's tied to licensing, you know, there's any number of requirements to have a license, and, and DHS, I'm sure, although this is not my area of expertise in terms of what they do for child care licensing, I'm sure has all sorts of inspections and responding to complaints and a process that they go through uh, when they have any number of different issues that arise at a licensed uh, facility. Uh, so I don't have a specific answer to you about how the agency would enforce this provision as tied to the many other provisions they have. Certainly we could follow up with the agency, though. Uh, thank you, Representative Stevenson. And I'll mention, too, as we're starting to get into licensing, and licensing really doesn't fall into this area here. We're looking more at the sections around the uh, SED treatment, uh, things that might be impacting on the background studies uh, and some of those areas. So I just want to try to – I know that testimony I let go a little far because some of the people have not testified before. So I did allow a little broader range here, but I do want to keep us a little bit more focused with the – time we have left. Yeah. And that's all I have. Thank you, okay. Chair. You're welcome. And then Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, and to um, Representative Stevenson, I, a couple of the, the testimony today was obviously wrenching the, the Bacchus family and their loss. And again, a lot of us here kind of know what that is like. Um, it's very specific. It's very personal. I mean, you, you know that. Um, and the two things that they brought up were also the same two things that the Minnesota Society of Child and Adolescent Psychology brought to your attention as well. And I think those are two really important items that I'd like to share today. This, this committee deals a lot with substance use disorder. So I want to just talk a little bit about that. Um, I've shared with many of my members around here why I'm having a hard time support this because I've sat in so many support uh, uh, counseling groups where, where uh, cannabis was the beginning of that pathway that got him there. I don't think that I'm going to sit here and tell you that that it's the worst thing I've seen because I will tell you one of the reasons I've actually really gotten kind of behind the medical cannabis is because of the guardrails the state of Minnesota has set up. That is something actually I'm sorry I, was not, I wasn't around here when it started but because of the tightness and the control of it it made it it made it come out with the word cannabis in a way that wasn't just sort of like laughed at or scoffed at. Now, I know it's expensive. I know there's things because of that tightness, it, it caused some other issues for people. Um, but my question might be to you, Representative Stevenson, is there's got to be a limit on the THC discussion. That is one thing that I'm ask, I want to ask you today is why do you think that's not an important part of your bill is to have a limit on how much THC could be in these products? Uh, Representative Stevenson. Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, I have thought a lot about potency limits. Uh, as you mentioned, it's been brought up by a number of people and, and groups. I've talked uh, not only with people who are asking for that, but also with people who work in the existing medical uh, program about how that might work. And I've also talked with um, uh, people who use medical uh, cannabis about how that would impact. It's a complex issue in part because you have different products. So a potency limit that might make sense for flour would not make sense for vapes, for example. Um, and I think there's also um, a question of whether there should be one at all. I mean, there are certainly many people out here in this room, I'm sure, who would argue to you that there's no potency limit. You can go buy, you know, grain alcohol uh, that is very, very high level of alcohol concentrate uh, at a liquor store. And so some people would say the whole conversation should not be happening. Um, but it's something I've thought about. I don't, at this point, think that there's a workable way to do it in, in statute, given the number of products and the complications that arise from going in that direction. I think... Um, there might be some avenues through rulemaking to discuss uh, what powers the commissioner might have, or the commissioner, the, the director of the office, excuse me. But I don't think that a potency limit in statute makes sense. Representative Baker. Mr. Chair, and again, to the author, do other states have limits? Representative Stevenson. 
Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, most do not. Uh, I'm aware of one for sure. Vermont has a potency limit in statute. I think there's one other one, but pop quiz, I, I'm not, I have to get back to you. But most of the 20 whatever states, most do not. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a, just a couple more questions. Um, and, I, and again, I know there's a few states that do have limits. And you're, I think you're correct in that. I haven't checked all of them either. But I think just our understanding here in Minnesota, if you start with some more guardrails and if it doesn't seem to make sense, we can always come back to it. You can't, though, reel it back in. Once growers and producers and retailers and all the stories we heard about setting up a system and policies in Minnesota or any state, you just can't change it then. But you can out of the gate. And I think I'm just suggesting, I, 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 you know, I can only suggest and I can only vote, but that is a huge part of this bill that frightens people. There's no limit. Again, the potencies today are much different than they used to be. So in the other area that I, I really hope you focus on, and, and, and again, going back to the the letter from the psychiatrists that study this every day. I've seen it in my studies with substance use disorder. When your brains are under 25 years old, it is a real problem. They are, the neurons are still growing, they're still hot as, as can be. I get starting at 25 years old with this is not easy to do, but it's the right thing to do, Representative. And I'm just asking you to think about this. Again, you can, you can relax this down the road if it's not, doing it well, but it has been proven time and time again that age is critical about when a child should start smoking, using any kind of drug, whether it's an opioid or alcohol or anything. We've known this, and yet all the things we know today should be practiced in your bill. That is kind of what I'm saying is we know more today than we've ever known before. So we can talk about this as we go forward, and I appreciate the ability to talk about this, but this committee especially this committee especially should know this, and we should ask that. We should pause this thing. We should, let's get this right. I get it's going to go through the system, but let's get it right. Let's not damage any more kids because they, if they're 21 and they're not supposed to have it, but you know when it comes access to 21, 18 year olds are gonna have e easier access to it because they're gonna know 21 year olds, and that's just how the, it works. So I ask this committee to start looking at this stuff hard. This is. This is why we have these election certificates. We have to do this the right way. But let's ask these tough questions, not, not just because it's, it's, it's a headlines, but this has to get done right in Minnesota. And what's wrong with Minnesota? If we pass a bill, but it has more guardrails in other states, I think then we're doing the responsible thing to do. So I just, I share that, and, I, and to the author, my final comments, just, I really hope that you and I can continue to have these conversations, or others can have that. This is, to me, the two most important things that your bill could improve on are those two areas. And I would appreciate you looking at it honestly, talking about this. It's okay to be outside the, the norm of other 18, 20 states, but do the right thing. That's all I'm asking you to do because too many people in Minnesota have paid an ultimate price for, for things that get into the systems of our kids, our people that are still developing, and I ask that you really look at that seriously. So I appreciate your, your comments and always asking for input. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, next, I have Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, it's a big bill, and it goes into a lot of areas, but I will limit my comments to um, what this committee has uh, jurisdiction on right now. And uh, so much of the testimony that we had today were people that were talking about the marijuana medical usage, and, and I'm sure Representative Backer um, who is a paramedic and, and testify and would uh, agree. Um, when you're in law enforcement and you start going out, you're the first, when anyone calls uh, for an ambulance, law enforcement is the first one there. So what well, you find out when someone's got cancer and you find out and you will become on a first name basis when someone gets uh, terminal cancer mm -hmm. and all the things, many of the medicals that we go on, I believe, are related to the actual treatment that they're getting, not necessarily the cancer. So I've seen the effects of the medical marijuana, and uh, I, as, as a person who's staunchly against recreational use marijuana, I'll be the first one to say that the medical use um, has big benefits. 
if you were here and testifying that you're upset about why medical marijuana is so expensive, it's because, well, I wasn't here when it happened, but I'm going to guess there was a bill about this big that uh, set up, you can call it guardrails, um, you, I, I can call it set up protectionism. You know, medical marijuana is so expensive right now because there's a whole bunch of people that had direct interest that received something out of that bill. It doesn't have to be as expensive as it is. Um, that being said, four, five, six years from now, there's going to be testimony from people coming into this committee saying legalizing marijuana has really devastated my life and it had long-term effects on me, and I'm not going to be the one that has my fingerprint on that. So I'll be a no, and I recommend everyone else vote no. Thank you, Representative Novotny. Next, I have Representative Edelson and then Representative Finke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Stevenson, your giant bill's taking up my entire area over here. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, some of it is your bill. Yeah, some, some, some of it is my bill. Um, thank you for carrying that. So um, I guess uh, what I wanted just to say is um, I, on 2.18.18, um, the sober home um, allowing for the substance user. Oh. Um, <laughs> allowing... Uh, making sure that uh, we may be able to prohibit somebody from using those in a sober home. I want to just thank you for that. I think that's, that's good language. Um, and then also under 245 CO5, looking at the background studies, um, I have a bill that's really looking at people uh, that have uh, low level offenses that are not able to work. We have a workforce shortage. Representative Baker, you and I are, are working, uh, looking at this. And I think this is a really good provision. I want to thank you for that. There are so many things in this bill, and I know that we're just kind of going to confine them to a smaller piece. Um, but just to, to Representative Baker, um, you have always been an advocate on this, and I just I want to thank you for that. And, and noting the 26 years, um, in an ideal world, we could do that. And I'm somebody that authored Tobacco 21. I hear you. We want to keep substances away from developing brains. Um, but the reality is, is, is somebody at 21 is, is going to find it. And so I just... Um, I, I just, I, I just, um, moving it to 26 is going to be really impossible to actually like be able to implement. So uh, I just, I want to thank you, Representative Stevens, and for having, I mean, there's a lot of feedback and you're making a lot of changes throughout um, every committee you're going to. And just thank you for working with the advocates. Mm -hmm. It is coming. It is going to be here. So I think the best thing that we can do is work with our author on making sure that we have the best bill for the state of Minnesota. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Representative Edelson. Uh, and then uh, Representative Finke, and then we'll go to the vote. Thank you very much, Chair Fisher and Representative Stevenson for your bill. Uh, this is the second time I've heard it. I have a quick couple of quick questions. Um, how readily available do you feel like marijuana products are to people who are under 21 right now? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Finke, I think that uh, cannabis products in Minnesota are readily available to anyone who wants them. Yeah, if they okay. Were to go and look for them. Representative Finke. I appreciate that. Um, I agree. How long do you think people who have been uh, victims of a racist white supremacist war on drugs who are waiting for their automatic expungements should have to wait for people to decide? whether or not marijuana products are already available to literally anyone who wants one anywhere in the state. Representative Stevenson. Mr. Chair, Representative Finke, uh, appreciate the question. And let me answer it this way by saying that, as you know, as member members of the committee know, I am a prosecutor in my day job. And uh, I think that it is unambiguous and without question that the criminal justice system has failed in its effort uh, to control cannabis and that the costs, both on a human level and on a dollar level, so immensely outweigh any benefit that we gain uh, from the path we are on uh, as to make it 
a very compelling case that we need a new approach. Uh, Rep. Finke, and uh, we're drifting off where our key sections are here, so. Oh, we've got, we've got automatic expungement in our okay. section. That's the only reason I ask, but okay. I'm, I'm done. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we will move to the vote. I will renew my motion that House File 100, as amended, is re-referred to the Education Finance Committee. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. No. 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 Uh, the motion as amend, highest file 100 as amended is referred to the Education and Finance Committee. Uh, seeing there's no further business, our next hearing will be on Wednesday the 15th, and we'll be hearing House File 1486 from Representative Frederick at that time, and we'll be hearing more about the policy responses to the opioid epidemic. Thank you all for a respectful discussion today and for your time.